Good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you. You are the early birds because we know there are people that scooch in here a little bit later, and that's just fine. But welcome to all of you who are here and all of you who are here online with us this morning. I'm Reverend Mary Murray Shelton. I am the community spiritual leader here at Golden Gate Center for Spiritual Living, and we are an inclusive community. What that means is that we welcome everybody who comes through the door and your history, your background, your ethnicity, your past religion, if any, and so on. Those are not a problem. We're happy to have you exactly as you are. You are whole, complete, and perfect, just as you are. And so welcome, welcome online, welcome here, and I'm gonna invite you to welcome each other. So if you just stand up, walk around, say good morning to each other, and then when we come back, we'll get ready to sing. So go ahead and say hi. And those of you online, pour yourself another cup of coffee, give yourself a hug, and we'll be right back with you in just a minute. Come back and take your seats. We're going to have you stand and sing in just a moment. I want to um, point out to you that we have our wonderful Karen Drucker here with us live this morning. <laughs> she who needs no introduction. Turning it over to Karen. Good morning. How are you? Nice to see you all. Nice to be here. And to my online fans of Ann Pogue in Illinois, say hello. Yay! Uh, so I've got a brand new song for you. I wrote this with Gary Lynn Floyd. I guess he he played it last week for you or something, huh? Yeah. So maybe. So we know this song. Too. All right. So it goes like this. Let me do it slow. Oh wait. Well, let me do it slow once that you really get it. Okay. We are one. We are in unity. We are a loving, inclusive community. We are grateful, and everyone is welcome here. We spread our love into the world. So that's the first part. The second part goes like this. We are one. We are in unity. We are one. We are one. And we are one. We are in unity. We are one. We are one. Everyone go, ah, just go, ah. Very good. Are you ready to do it? We are one. We are in unity. We are a loving, inclusive community. We are grateful. Everyone is welcome here. We spread our love into the world. Do that again. We are one. We are in unity. We are a loving, inclusive community. We are grateful, everyone is welcome here. We spread our love into the world. Next part. We are one, we are in unity. We are one, we are one, we are one. We are a loving, inclusive community. We are grateful. Everyone is welcome here. We spread our love into the Let's go to the next part again. We are one. We are in unity. We are one. We are one. What do you feel like you're one? We are one. We are in unity. We are one. We are one. We are one. We are a loving, inclusive community. 
We are grateful everyone is welcome here. We spread our love into the world. We spread our light. We spread our light into the world. We spread our joy. We spread our joy into the world. We spread our love. We spread our love into the world. Yes, we do. Yay. You sound great. Excellent, excellent. So I'm going to invite you to go ahead and silence your cell phones so they don't ring and disturb us during the meditation or the service this morning. And just begin to get centered and turn within. And Leslie Gennetti is our morning practitioner. She's going to come up and do the opening for us in just a moment. I have a brand new chant for you. You can listen to this once and sing with me. <clears throat> I open my heart to healing in this moment. I open my heart to love. I open my heart to healing in this moment. When I open my heart, I am healed. That's the whole thing. my heart to the heart of the universe the one infinite life the magnificent all in all it is in all and through all it is around all above all and below all it is the life within every cell and atom and as it pours itself across the universe it pours itself through each one it renews itself through each one. It renews itself through every moment. It recreates everything. And each one is a unique, individualized vessel for renewal and wholeness in the infinite life. I speak my word for each one and I claim an opening in consciousness for the resonant realization of the life within the light within, which is always healing itself and eliminating anything unlike its own light. It moves each one forward through inspiration. The impulse of life beckons each one to something new, something interesting, and something true. And accepting this is accepting the truth of being, which always results in wholeness, aliveness and oneness so the light within each one is alive awake and aware every moment and even in this service it beckons reverend mary to speak the truth and to the music to inspire and for each one to feel connection this is the truth of life and this i celebrate this morning and i give thanksgiving for the opening that takes place in consciousness and allows each one to experience their innate fulfillment, their innate wholeness. And I release my word to the law of mind, which accepts my word as a brand new creation, ready to celebrate itself today. And so it is. Amen. It's never I open my heart to healing in 
this moment I open my heart to love I open my heart to healing in this moment and I open my heart I am do when we have sit, negative feelings? Sit, do we run away? No, I do. <laughs> but sometimes you just gotta kind of sit in it. If I've got a problem, sit with it. Don't know where I'm going, sit with it. Trust and know the answer will flow if I just sit with to do though I don't have to run around in circles, in circles. get myself so stressed. so stressed things seem to work out better when I focus on how I'm blessed, I'm so blessed. making a decision your part sit with it Trying to choose the right way, sit with it. I've got to trust and know the answer will flow if I just sit with it. Sit with it, hey. <laughs> and I don't have to force the issue when I relax and quiet my chattering mind. It all comes together in its own sweet time. Oh, sweet time. I don't have to struggle. Sit with it. It will be revealed. Sit with it. I've got to trust and know the answer will flow if I just sit with it. Hey. All right, everyone, do this. Now this is the freeform dance section. You can dance in your seats a little bit. Sit with it. Now here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna lounge on a lazy boy reclining chair on a rocker or a sofa cause I don't have a care. On a bar stool or a hammock or just sit anywhere. I'm gonna sit. I'm gonna sit. I'm gonna sit. I'm gonna sit with it. Don't have to struggle. Sit with it. It will be revealed. Sit with it. I've got to trust and know those answers will flow if I just sit with it. I've got to trust and know. So we'll flow if I just sit with it. Sit with it. I'm gonna sit with it. Sit with it. I'm gonna just sit and feel it. Let all that negativity be there. Sit with it. Whatever's supposed to happen. I'm gonna sit. I'm gonna sit. I'm gonna just sit with Oh, yeah, this is good. This is good. So this month we've been talking about how to see through negative circumstances and conditions and so on. And today we're talking about the secret purpose of negativity. Don't you want to know what that is? The secret, what the heck is the reason for this? You know, I'm always grateful when somebody posts on Facebook why a certain insect is a, is a value particularly if it's something that I haven't seen the value of up until that point. 
uh, or other critters like snakes and things, you know, what do they do? Well, they do this and they do that and they do something else. It's like, oh, I see, okay, good. So with the negative things that happen to us, we sometimes, um, we go into either, oh, poor me, this is terrible, this is awful, nobody loves me, I guess I'll eat some worms, you know, that kind of thing. Or we just blow it off and pretend it isn't there and act like everything's fine. Meanwhile, in, inwardly, we're all churned up and everything. So guy ran a red light and he got a ticket, of course, but the way that it worked was, it was one of those uh, cameras at the intersection that caught him. And so when they mailed him his ticket, they mailed him a photograph that clearly showed him and his license plate, right? So the fine was like $40 for this. It wasn't a big deal. Um, so he thought, oh, this is very entertaining that they sent me this ticket based on a photograph. So he sent them a photograph of $40. <laughs> and they sent him a photograph of handcuffs. And he immediately wrote a check for $40 and stuck it in the mail. This is, you know, when we're, we feel like Sisyphus, like, you know, we've been asked to push a rock up a hill, but then just when we get to the top of the hill, it rolls over us and rolls back down to the bottom and we have to go back and start over again. That's kind of our impression of life. It's like one thing after another or several things hit us at once, you know, um, and in that process, it is really difficult to see the forest for the trees. I mean, my father-in-law, who was a retired Air Force colonel when I was married to my husband, that father-in-law, um, he said, it's hard to remember when you're up to your, <laughs> in alligators, that your objective was to drain the swamp. Hard to remember that. So for us, the ultimate purpose of why we're going through negativity is not necessarily easy for us to find. And there are two kinds of negatives we experience. We experience, this is called karma, right? He sets something in motion that comes around and smacks him. But he doesn't realize that what he did set that into motion because he can't see how it's all connected and what's happening. So we've got an inner negative sometimes, that's setting something into motion for us, and it yields an outer negative that is a painful experience. The inner negative is connected to thoughts and feelings and beliefs, and we're not consciously always putting that into creative law, but creative law never sleeps. So it's always acting on what's running through whether we're aware of what's running through or not in the negative. And then in the outer world, we have a painful experience, but we're not sure how that's connected to us in any way. It might be a loss of something. Usually it's a loss of some kind in our life, a loss uh, in a relationship or uh, with money or with our work or with our health or with just everything around us seeming to be, everybody's having trouble and problems and we're worried about all of them and we don't know what to do. Anybody ever have a day, a week, a month, a year that feels like that, yeah? So one of the interesting things about learning in life from the negatives that happen to us is to be a learner. This is from George Leonard who wrote the book Mastery and also, um, the life we are given, and some other things. And he said, to be a learner, you've got to be willing to look like a fool. You've got to be willing to be a fool, to look like a learner, to actually learn from something. And I realized that one of the reasons that I was able to be an actor when I was on stage was that I was willing to and able to put aside my concern that I would look stupid doing something and go ahead and be stupid. You know the Sunday I showed up with my 4th of July glasses and my hat? If I want to impress somebody, that's not how I would show up, right? So if, you, if you're willing to look like a fool, then 
your learning possibilities are greatly expanded, and so are your expression possibilities. I think artists have to be willing to look like a fool in order to take a risk with their creativity to bring something forward that they don't know for sure is gonna really work. Are you with me here so far? Um, we started watching um, uh, The Newsroom again, which is an Aaron Sorkin show. And if you ever watched West Wing, you know, the newsroom was another one that Aaron Sorkin did, and everybody's very snappy in the way they talk, but they say a lot of funny things, and some of the things that they're doing or, or saying don't turn out well because they didn't think it through or they were so attached to the outcome that they went ahead and did it, and then they wish they'd listened to somebody else. And at one point in the newsroom, there's a discussion about uh, this financial term, which is the greater fool. And the woman who's the financial uh, commentator on this news channel says to uh, Jeff Daniels, who is the, the news anchor, um, she says, the greater fool is an economic term. It's a patsy. For the rest of us to profit, we need a greater fool, someone who will buy long and sell short. Most people spend their life trying not to be the greater fool. We toss him the hot potato. We dive for his seat when the music stops. The greater fool is someone with the perfect blend of self-delusion and ego to think that he can succeed where others have failed. And then she says, this whole country was made by greater fools. The greater fool is the one who's willing to take the risk on that edge of is this gonna work out well or not? Well, on the off chance that this is gonna work out well, I'm willing to take the risk. Have any of you ever done that, taken that risk and then had it turn out really well and taken the risk and then had it turn out really badly? I've done both those things. And yet it hasn't dampened my interest in taking the risk. Most of the time I'm willing to do that um, Septima Clark said, I have a great belief in the fact that whenever there is chaos, it creates wonderful thinking. I consider chaos a gift. What a perspective. I consider chaos a gift. And so when we're in this experience, the first response when something we've risked doesn't go well is, or when we don't realize it's related to us at all and something negative is happening, we're thinking, why? Why is this happening? Why me? Why is this happening to me? Why does everything always happen to me, right? As if nothing like this ever happened to anybody else. Ernest Holmes, our founder, wrote an effective prayer. Fear and faith are identical in that the energy used in one as the same energy that is used in the other. But since there is only one final energy in the universe, and this final energy is the energy of thought, these have the same background or root. He says, energy is the energy of thought. Fear is a positive acceptance that you shall experience that which you dislike. And faith is a positive acceptance that you shall experience that which you do like. But they are identical in this mental action. The only difference is in the direction. So are we going toward fear or are we going toward faith? When we're looking at a negative, are we looking for the positive in it or are we focused on the negative? You know, I, I have a process that I do in some of my workshops where I take people through a particularly emotional experience for them in relating about it to another person, but they never tell the person what the experience is specifically. Instead, they describe what they were thinking, what they were feeling, what action they took, what decisions they made about life based on that experience without ever telling the other person what the experience was. It's very freeing because the other person can't judge you because they don't know what you did really or what happened. And then in the process, at the end, they're asked to go within and then identify for themselves some strength they gained from that that they use in their life now. And nobody has ever said in one of my workshops, I couldn't come up with one. 
Never. Now, I don't tell them the experience they're focused on needs to be negative or needs to be positive just to pick something. But a lot of people, what comes up automatically for them is something that wasn't so pleasant. And then we turn it to say, well, what did this cause in my life? What did I learn? Sometimes we make a bunch of negative choices as a result of that kind of smackdown until we discover that that's really not working for us. And so ultimately, it flips us over into something else, right? Joseph Campbell said, if you want to change the world, you have to change the metaphor. Interesting. So when we're experiencing that negative cycle, part of it is to assist us to look at our own inner thinking and begin to teach us how to use that creative law a little more effectively to move it in the direction we want instead of the one we don't want. It also reveals what works and doesn't work, gives us consequences, and gives us the possibility to grow stronger and gain confidence because we gained something out of it that we needed. Maybe we didn't know we needed it at the time, but we discover that it becomes useful for us in life later on, something that we were wanting. So the ultimate purpose of it really is to support us to grow in healthy, strong, capable, confident ways in the world. That's not easy to get to when we're in the middle of it. But we don't necessarily need to get there yet while we're in the middle of it. When we can, that's fabulous. But sometimes it takes a little time afterwards for us to look back and say, oh, oh, that's what this was for. When I was in graduate school, I was studying in a PhD program for psychology, which I never finished, by the way. I was studying it not because I wanted to be a therapist, but because I wanted to add something to my skill set, you know? And when I was finished with all my coursework, that summer, my grandson was born, and his mom experienced postpartum psychosis. So she ended up in the hospital, and then it was so severe they recognized and diagnosed her with bipolar disorder, bipolar 1, which is the most serious. She had not had an episode before that, but it was triggered in the labor because there was an underlying latency to it. And so when that happened and she was behaving strangely during that week after my grandson was born or that two weeks, I said to my son, because I had been up there and been with them, and I, I heard her say some things that I was a little concerned about. So I said to Luke, there is such a thing as postpartum psychosis, and it, it doesn't get better on its own. So if you notice that she doesn't seem like herself, take her to the hospital, and they'll be able to help her because you know you would want her to have that help. And that's what ultimately happened. But I had called then various people who were instructors uh, where I was going to school and said, it looks like this is what's happening. What do we do? What's, what's the best next step? And they were the ones that helped give me information and tell me where to look and how to find more resources. And I realized at that point that I went to graduate school so that I would know what to do when this happened, because otherwise I wouldn't have known. It was for that moment, not so I could have a PhD in psychology. Does this make sense, what I'm saying? Uh, you know, Steve Jobs said in his address in Berkeley one, uh, one time that you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking back, but you can see how the steps you took in your life before led you here on purpose because all of that was for this moment. And that's what our experiences of negativity do for us. They lead us in that direction. Rainer Maria Rilke said, wonders happen if we can succeed in passing through the harshest danger, but only in bright, purely granted achievement can we realize the wonder 
take your practiced powers and stretch them out until they span the chasm between two contradictions. For the God wants you to know himself in you. So, a man woke up one morning and he discovered an immense rock in his front yard. Never seen it before, but the thing was enormous. And he heard God say to him, push this rock. And so he did. Like, push it with all your strength, with all your might. So he did. All that day. All the next day. For days on end. Week after week. Month after month. But it never moved. Finally, in frustration one day, he said, God, what is the point of this? You told me to push the rock. I have put my shoulder against it. I have dedicated myself to it. I have tried in every physical way. I've given everything you ask of me, and I haven't moved the darn thing as much as a millimeter. Why have you given me this hopeless, impossible, endlessly boring task to do? And God said to the man, I never told you to move the rock. I told you to push the rock. Now you think that you've failed. But is that really true? Look at you. Your hands and your arms are strong and muscular. Your back is sinewy and brown. Your hands are calloused from the pressure and your legs have become massive and hard. And through your persistence at pushing the rock, you've grown stronger and your abilities now surpass those that you used to have. You've learned discipline, training, and persistence. And to make you strong in all these ways was the purpose of the rock. That was your task, and you've accomplished it. Now, I'll remove the rock. And it was gone. We don't always know why we're pushing that rock up the hill while it's happening. But it has a useful purpose, and it can be available to us when we're willing to look like a fool and actually look for the blessing. Look for the blessing. You know, um, People call you Pollyanna when you do that. When I was in college, my cohort in my acting class referred to me, my best friends referred to me as Pollyanna. And the reason that started is because at one of our acting finals, our acting teachers, and we had several of them, they all came to watch the finals to see how we had accomplished various things that they'd been teaching and coaching us on throughout the term. And we had an older, English acting teacher. She was a marvelous performer. Not a great teacher, but a marvelous performer. And so Joan came to watch us do our finals. And we were in the Penthouse Theater at the University of Washington, which doesn't exist anymore now, but it was a theater in the round, the first one west of the Rockies. And so the lights were dimmed in the house, and we were doing our scenes, and Joan fell asleep. And so she didn't see a lot of the scenes. And afterwards, my two friends were like rolling their eyes and commiserating about this. It's like, how could she fall asleep? She's supposed to be grading us on, on this performance and she didn't even see it. I mean, really, what was the point in even coming? And I said, well, it was nice of her to come and try to stay awake. Thank you, Pollyanna. That was their, that was their response to me on that. So it's like, yeah, okay, I get it. Um, sometimes things don't turn out the way that we want them to. And if we can think about it and make up a new story, tell ourselves a new reason, give ourselves possibilities, even without knowing, make it up. Why might this be actually helpful to me somehow? Why? We tell ourselves a new story. I'm going to tell you this man's story. The fireball was about 10 feet high and four feet wide. The flame was blue and searing with the peculiar intense heat of gasoline burning in the open air. Even standing 50 feet away on the corner of 26th and South Van S, you would have felt the increase in temperature on your face and hands. A warmth that easily cut through San Francisco's gentle early summer. And you would have had company. 
A mysterious bonfire in the middle of an urban center draws a crowd. But this is only what I've been told. I can't comment personally on the fireball's external dimensions and characteristics. I was in it. I'm hazy on the view from the inside. One of the many nice things about the design of a human brain is that it erases tapes that would be too painful to replay. The actual experience of the fire certainly fits that criterion, but if hell on earth ever existed for real, <clears throat> it was here on July 19th, 1971. How had it happened? In retrospect, it was almost like a movie. Just when everything starts going well, the hero gets a pie in the face, a Dear John letter, a knife in the back, or a bullet between the eyes. Similarly, the fireball capped the best day of my life. That morning, I had fulfilled a lifelong dream by soloing in an airplane for the first time, an experience I can only describe as orgasmic. That afternoon, I was riding my motorcycle, not just any motorcycle. This was a Honda 750. At the time, the biggest, snazziest, meanest motorcycle on the market. I had bought it just the day before, and I adored it. As I rode that morning, I felt grand, and not just because of my new student pilot's license and my new wheels. I was 28 years old, handsome, at least I thought so, in perfect health. I had a marvelous romantic job as a cable car gripman, plenty of money, many good friends, a gorgeous girlfriend. It was even a nice day. In short, I felt like the king of San Francisco. Sousa ran over the realm, the potentate of the far territories, as I zoomed up South Van Ness. South Van Ness is a four-lane street, at least it was then. I was in the outside lane heading north. A maroon laundry truck was tooling along next to me in the inside northbound lane. And as we reached 26th, the laundry truck suddenly turned right, smack in my way, cutting me off and I hit the truck squarely in the side. I went down, crushing my left elbow and cracking my pelvis. This was serious, but hardly life-threatening. But the lid on the gas tank popped open, and two and a half gallons of gasoline poured out onto the hot engine and onto me. The whole business went up with a whoosh. It was a strange sight, a nightmare scene, the kind of scene that freezes people. Though the fireball was visible for blocks, no one acted, at least not at first. They froze. If I had seen it, I might have frozen myself. But I'm here to write this because a man whose name I never learned, a man who sold cars in the auto lot at that intersection, grabbed a fire extinguisher and put me out. The ambulance arrived within three minutes. If that memory tape is still inside me, unplayed, I hope it never does get played. The motorcycle remained too hot to touch even 20 minutes later when police were investigating the accident. At San Francisco General Hospital, which is about 10 blocks from the accident scene, I was judged to be at, quote, the low end of survivability. In 1971, if you were burned over 75% of your body, you were definitely dead. I was burned over 65% of my body. Would put, which put my chances around 50-50. All that had been spared was my scalp, which had been covered by my motorcycle helmet, and most of my torso and arms, which had been protected by my leather jacket. As the nurses cut my still smoldering clothes off of me, I went into a coma, one that quickly deepened by the drugs I was given to lessen my shock. It would be two weeks before I would come around so much for the king of San Francisco. He says, my face looks like a badly made leather quilt. It has inspired children to chant, monster, monster, as I pass. I have no fingers. I cannot walk. Furthermore, all of this did not happen at once. First, I was burned to a crisp. And then four years later, in an entirely separate accident, I was paralyzed from the waist down. The average person might call me the unluckiest man alive, but what I hope to do in this book, so I'm taking this from his book, 
it's not what happens to you, it's what you do about it, is to teach you not to think like the average person. This book, part autobiography, part self-help lesson, aims to show you that nothing, absolutely nothing, is impossible. Or is, is absolute. He doesn't say impossible. It's absolute. Your life is entirely what you decide it is. It is your spaceship. You're up, you're down. The universe starts in your head and spreads out into the world. Change what happens in your head and the universe changes, really. And then, let's see if I can find this last bit where he says, um, as I say in my speeches, it's not what happens to you, it's what you do about it. This is Mitchell. What kind of success are we talking about? I can rattle off my resume stuff. Millionaire, mayor, member of many boards of directors, environmental leader, media personality, political commentator, commercial pilot, in-demand public speaker, even river rafter and skydiver, but these may not be, probably are not, your measures of success. Nonetheless, whatever you want, you can achieve it, just as I have. You can, because you're not different from me. I don't have any special powers, any magical gifts of birth that allowed me to create my own happiness in the face of trials. I am no smarter, no stronger than the average person. I am a long way from a saintly guy. In fact, one of the secrets I'll reveal is that being pushy and even obnoxious at the right times has been crucial to my success. Really, the only difference between you and me at the moment that I had the good fortune to learn a few important points along the way, both before and after my injuries, those happen to be immeasurable, and in this book, I'll pass them along to you. I have a great life. You can have a great life, too. Expect resolution in the midst of the negativity. Act from faith and think independently of the circumstances. Think beyond the circumstances that you're in. The only way to create something that transcends the negativity is to tell yourself a new story. That's what Mitchell did. And on a level that is um, applicable to our own lives, that's what we're here to learn. Always there's a new story we can tell that takes us further into the life we want to live regardless of appearances and circumstances and conditions. Namaste. All right, let's take a moment now and turn within so we can anchor this awareness. I am right here. I am right now. The infinite universe is in me. All the power of the creative law is flowing through me now. I have the power to choose where I focus what I choose to anchor within as the truth. And what is true of me is true of everyone in this room. So I speak this word for us knowing that every one of us is a receptacle and an expression of the infinite mind of God, always capable of seeing another perspective changing the story, bringing about a new outcome, no matter what the condition may be. So I open my mind to this. I stretch into a larger view. Doing this for all of us now, I know that greater possibilities are being revealed to us in this very moment, and we become aware of them 
because of our willingness, our willingness to go that distance, to be foolish, to take that risk, to hold a larger vision. The law says yes. For this I'm grateful. And together we say, and so it is. Please stand and join me for the morning affirmation. I know that every difficulty and negative challenge I face has a purpose I can benefit from. I open my mind and heart to this benefit, accepting it now. I refuse to let myself be stopped by these. I meet each one with more strength and faith than the one before. I am growing strong in seeing beyond conditions, and so it is. You may be seated, and I invite the ushers to come forward as we plan to receive the morning offering. If you'd like to text your offering this morning, you can do so by using the number on the screen. But for all of you, on the flip side of your bulletin in the lower left corner are all the different ways you can make contributions to Golden Gate, and we bless them all. We welcome them. We have all kinds of ideas for them. We want to send them out into the world to bring forth great good for all of us, for Golden Gate, and for the world. So we especially want to bring our conscious blessing to everything we give. So we're going to do that together right now. I invite you to hold your gift near your heart if you're giving it in the room this morning. Otherwise, this is symbolic of the gift you've already given. Or to hold it in your hands with your loved one if you are giving a gift together as we say this blessing in unison. This gift I give is God in action. I now send it forth to bless and to prosper. I know that everywhere it goes, it is creating a world living in love, one heart and one thought at a time. And so it is. Go ahead. Ooh, I'm never alone. We are never I am never, ever alone. All right, so you can wiggle in your seats a little bit, especially when you're going through hard times to just know that you are never alone. That's what I want to affirm right now. I don't walk alone. Cause spirit is with me always Grace fills me now I don't walk alone That's the whole thing I don't walk alone Spirit is with me always Grace fills me now I don't walk alone Want to join me? I don't walk alone Spirit is with me always Grace fills me now I don't walk alone now I don't walk alone Spirit is with me always Grace fills me now I don't walk alone I felt so lost I couldn't find my way Searching for the answer Trying to make it through the day I called out for help Felt something shift inside A presence a power that cannot be denied. I don't walk alone. Spirit is with me always. Grace fills me now. Sing with me now. Affirm it. I don't walk alone now. I don't walk alone. Cause spirit is with me always. Grace fills me now. I don't walk alone. No matter what I call it. No matter what I believe, I know that when I'm hurting, if I ask, I will receive the love that I am needing, the peace within my soul. I can surrender and let go. I don't walk 
alone walk. Spirit is with me always. Grace fills me now. Grace, I don't walk alone. I don't walk alone. I don't walk alone. Walk. Spirit is with me always. Grace fills me now. Grace, I don't walk alone. I don't walk alone. Never alone. We're never alone. We are never ever alone. I'm never alone. I'm never alone. I am never ever alone. Want to affirm that with me? Just say, I am never alone. Never alone. I am never ever alone. I am never alone. Spirit is with me, never. Spirit is with me, I'm never, ever alone. Spirit is with me, never alone. Never alone, I am never, ever alone. I'm never, ever, ever alone. I'm never alone. I'm never ever ever alone. Never ever ever alone. Uh uh. Never ever ever alone. Never ever ever alone. Uh uh. Never ever ever alone. Never ever ever alone. Never ever ever alone. And so on behalf of Golden Gate Center for Spiritual Living, we, all of us now, accept this offering. And now that it's blessed, we intentionally send this, along with everything else that we've received in this past week, we send it into all of the different areas where money goes from Golden Gate with the blessing of seeing through the negativity that is visible in the world. And we send that power out to everybody who comes in contact with something from Golden Gate this week, so that the possibility of waking up a little more is available, and so it is. All right. Okay, now if you're with us for the very first time this morning, I want to draw your attention to the table back here. Galen is holding up the welcome packets. Everything on that table is available for you to pick up and take with you if you're interested in it. And we encourage you to take a welcome packet, take out the blue card that's inside, and fill that out. Give it to Galen, and she's going to give you a little book as our thank you to you for being here today and also as your invitation to come back often. We welcome you. In fact, we're having a picnic today. I'm going to tell you about it in a few minutes. So you're welcome to come to the picnic. And it doesn't matter if you didn't bring food today because there'll be food. Just come and join us and we'll be over there out in the, by, the, by, by Pixley Road. All right. We also want to thank everybody who did anything this morning to set up. We love the doors over here. The doors, the gateways, the locks and the passages through and the keys that the Frost family brought this morning because part of what we did this morning was we looked at locked doors and how we might find our way through those. So you have a key now and you might want to take a look at this wonderful big lock, the close-up that's right there in the middle. Let's take a moment and thank everybody that helped and of course Karen once again. Yes. So today's the picnic, and um, if you brought food, God bless you. Uh, the, some of the guys are already out there getting things going, getting the charcoals going for the grill and all that good stuff, so we know that's all um, in progress. We're grateful for that. And so please join us. Uh, but first, before you join us for the picnic, Karen has a table over here, and I want to tell you Go say hello to Karen and look at her stuff, because if you don't have a Karen Drucker CD, you are missing out, my friend. Um, you really want one of those. So she's got some over there. Make sure you have a chance to talk to her. Plus, she's just really fun to talk to. So 
and then come to the picnic because, you know, it's going to be going on and we'll get out there. It will happen. We'll get there, all right? Uh, Do Reverend, no, not Reverend, but Dr. Suzanne Dubois, who is a practitioner, is going to be offering writing as a spiritual practice. That is coming up August 20th at the Learning Center. It is live only, not on Zoom. It's from 1 to 4. And it will be on a love offering basis. Put that on your calendar now. It's a wonderful opportunity to learn how your intuition can speak to you through certain prompts she can give you to write, and your mind will produce a response to that prompt, and you can see it right in front of you. I mean, you do have to move your hand, but, you know. So <clears throat> think about getting there for that. And this Wednesday night, the meditation is guided meditation at 7.15. We do that on Zoom only. So you can join it by clicking the link on the website calendar page for the event uh, at 7.15 on Wednesday, and you'll be joining us on Zoom, and this week it's a guided meditation. And finally, Karen has some dates at Cafe Arrivederci, and one of them is coming up August 1st. That's a Tuesday evening from 5.30 to 9.30. Reservations are recommended, but you can talk to Karen more about that when you go over to schmooze with her and look at her CDs. So that's it for this morning's um, announcements. And I'd like to invite the practitioners now to surround the room as we prepare for our closing. Remember, one of the things that we believe in most in our teaching is prayer, because prayer allows us to intentionally focus our attention where we want it to go so that the creative law has direction that moves us in the way we want to go rather than some other way. You have lots of opportunities for prayer with these folks if you make an appointment, with the practitioner serving at the table this morning if you want a prayer after the service, feel free to do that. We're not gonna shut that down right away. There's a prayer box over there where you can put in a written request and there are all kinds of ways to, uh, to do prayer requests. So take advantage of that. You know, you're, you're here and we're supporting you in prayer. So right now, let's turn within one more time. And all of the practitioners are gonna join me now in this closing prayer. We're doing a prayer chamber where the atmosphere of prayer enfolds all of us simultaneously in giving and receiving. And all of you in the middle, your job is just to take it in. So here we go. As I turn inside right now, I recognize and know that the one infinite life of God is right here, right now, filling me up, flowing out into our And so it is. Please stand and join us now for the closing blessing and the closing song. So we say together, I now walk so that whoever walks beside me dwells in the presence of God. And whoever places a hand in mine is lifted. And whoever thinks of me is illumined with God consciousness for spirit and all people 
and I are one eternally. And so it is. You know this one. Let there be peace. I am a stand for peace. Let there be love. I am a stand for love. Let there be joy. I am a stand for joy. We are making a new world now. Let there be peace. I am a stand for peace. Let there be love. I am a stand for love. Let there be Let there be joy, and I am a stand for joy. We are making a new world. Now, one more time. Let there be peace. I am a stand for peace. Let there be love. I am a stand for love. Let there be joy. I am a stand for joy. Three times. We are making a new world. What? I didn't hear you. We Yes, we are. So it is.